Welcome to another episode of One on One with Mitch LaFonna. Joining me this week, two guests from Anthrax, singer Joey Belladonna talking about For All Kings and his love and appreciation of Journey and especially drummer, former drummer, I should say, Dean Castronovo. And on the other side, from Hardline, uh, singer Johnny Gioli. He's got a new album coming out on Pledge Music or there's a pledge campaign for it currently. And of course, he was in a band, Hardline, with Dean Castronovo. So we also talk about Dean with him. So it's a double Dean, double episode, double guests, and uh, double singers. So uh, before I go on too long and uh, ramble on forever and ever, let's get on to this double double. Here is from Anthrax, the one, the only, Joey Belladonna. We are speaking with Joey Belladonna, vocalist of Anthrax, the new album. For All Kings is, uh, Joey, pr- probably one of the best albums the band has done. I mean, it's, it really is not only a return to form, but if I may, e- even a bettering of form. I mean, the band is just killing on this album. Thank you. Well, that's great. Nice to hear from you again. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was happy to be able to get something that really was a little bit more indulging for me just as well. You know, it's just nice to be able to cover some ground and do some different arrangements and just uh, an overall better expectations, you know, it's great. Yeah, it really is. So, so tell me how, how involved were you in this one? Because of course, worship music had been recorded with another vocalist and you came in and you laid stuff on top or we, or they swapped it out. Um, it really is going back to persistence of time since you've been involved, right? So, so 25 years almost. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, when I came in with worship music, obviously, uh, they, there, there was some pre-production and, and there was recordings that they had done, but I, I don't really refer to it because I didn't really listen to much of it. And I didn't, I wasn't scolded or told to stay within the found, you know, the, the fine print, but you know, we did that for years. I'd always come in and there you know, hardly did any pre-production. The only difference is now, I mean, at least for me is, I'm alone. I don't have people uh, uh, beating me down on where to go, how to do it, when to do it, and all that kind of stuff. And I can go in there alone and do it. And I did that with worship too. But obviously, there was some pre-production again that they had maybe enjoyed, and, and I kind of stuck around with some of it. But I wasn't really instructed all the way to do any of that stuff. So, and again, this one, the new album for All Kings, I had nothing to go by which is great you know obviously there is again uh, a a laid out vocal pattern whether it be lyrics when scott gives me the lyrics like long ago just give me an idea where he wants to place it you know where do i come in when do i get out you know where's the chorus where's the pre-chorus where's the verses and all that stuff and then i just me and Jay go in there and we just kind of have a good time doing it with, with really less pressure. It's just a good, good vibe. I mean, I can actually execute a few things that I may never even got on the table or even had a, a chance to try with everybody going, no, 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 don't do that. Or, oh, that's, uh, or, oh, no, that's wrong. Or you're late or you're early or all the, all the sh- stuff that I used to get beat up on. And by the time I even got done, I didn't even know if I was happy doing what I was doing. It's just much easier and much more pleasant now and more fun just as well. Were you being beaten up, to use your words, by the band, or was it because of the business pressure where the record company would come in and say, hey, we need to sell this many, hey, we need something that can be on unre- I mean, where was this nope. pressure coming from? That came from people, I just think, you know, was there, there, you know, I joined a band, I think, and yeah, I, I believe I did. I joined a band. I mean, uh, it was obvious that I, it wasn't my band. When I got in there, I just think uh, me being a, a classic rocker, uh, whether they just they we just didn't want anybody to do anything without having a hand on it every moment, every turn. You know, spreading was a little, a little bit more open because I just got there and they were just letting me go a little bit. So there was a lot more crazy stuff going even then. But once I started getting in, 
once Among Living kicked off, man, I mean, I'm not saying that uh, spreading disease was easy, easy going, but it was a lot. I mean, I think they let me have, me and Carl, we were just having more experimental chances to do a few things, which we did, the harmonies and, you know, catchy choruses and all that kind of stuff. And I think the music was a little bit more straight up. But, yeah, the band was tough on, you know, what, you know, what I was doing, like Scott especially, because, you know, he, he – he just had his way of how he wanted me to do things. And again, I, I when you're, when you're singing, it doesn't mean that you're trying to do anything. Uh, sometimes it's a more of a natural thing. And I mean, to, to sing words real fast and pronounce them right and, and sing them with uh, the, the right attention, you know, the right, the right attack and all this stuff. It's just every little thing, everybody had their vision of it. So we were always, jumping on each other about what you know what i could do and how i should be doing it and stuff after a while i, I felt like some kind of hired dude that just walked into a barrage of of, of badgering you know how to sing stuff and i don't I mean, i'm surprised i got what i got over some of the stuff you know i mean now it's a lot more natural and i just don't have i don't worry about it i don't care i just do what i do and i sing the way i sing and i don't try and do anything above and beyond uh, what I feel in the song. Um, but I, I think I have a lot better chance at it now because I can at least try a lot of things. And me and Jay, first, first couple of tries on a lot of stuff with me, we're, we're right on track. And by the end of the day, we're not even spending 12 hours on vocals. And we're at a point, I don't even know what I'm doing. I mean, by six o'clock, we didn't even have a whole, whole song almost done to a point where they can actually hear it by morning and we can move on. And if they dig it, which they most of the time do, and we go, you know, we move on. Now, you mentioned Carl. I guess that means Carl Kennedy of the Rods. Kennedy, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, but back in the day, yes, back yeah. Back in the I day, mean, when I walked. It, talk to me a little bit about him because he sort of is responsible for getting into you into Anthrax, right? I, you know, I, I don't know the actual turn of events, like who called who, who found what, and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I definitely think he had a hand in it somewhere, and, and they were, you know, working with him pretty heavy in the early days and and i i didn't really know carl yet i mean he just knew of me through people i was working with in bible black and then just one one thing led to another i guess you know and uh and he was great to work with too because he was one of the one of us you know he was just really open-minded and but at the same time it was a band that had it was their band, it was their songs, their music, and I just got there. So everybody was on the on the lookout to make sure we didn't get too too sassy with everything, you know, right. or too crazy or too out there. Right. You mentioned that it's it's their music. I know you're a big Journey fan and you love Steve Perry. Was that more of your vocal style, and and was it sort of ironic that you ended up in a thrash band rather than in a melodic rock band like a? You know, like a Def Leppard or a Bon Jovi. I mean, what is your sort of natural vocal style? My well, my style. I, I didn't even know until when I got in a band. I mean, I when I was doing Bible Black, we really never even got out of the box to even try anything uh, thoroughly enough. Even the little demos we did, I don't even think we really even knew what we were doing then. We were just kind of biding some time, messing around. But I. I just felt that spreading disease, I started to hear what I could possibly do with that type of music, with that type of riffing and uh, lyrics and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I wasn't even sure, but I mean, I grew up more like doing, uh, you know, anything bluesy, whether it had been or, or uh, like a white snake or even a, a, a Zeppelin or a Rush or, or a, a, like you said, Journey or Deep Purple. I was really into that. Kansas, and yes, I loved a lot more of the fusion-y kind of rock, you know, kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't think I had any particular style until I really started hearing myself with Anthrax, and that's how I kind of gauged what I was doing. It was definitely more of a tenor, more of an upper range and stuff, but, I mean, I wasn't... I wasn't told I had to be a certain way, you know. I I just try to do things natural. And I think I have my own style, and I've stayed to my own style. And I don't, it's hard to really try to shift something. Well, as you can see, when the '90s kicked in, all of a sudden I wasn't right for the band. I mean, I don't know, you know. It's just kind of a weird thing. I I wouldn't have chased it, but they did, you know. And, and there's where I became. Uh, 
lost in the sauce, if you may. Uh, but, you know, obviously it wasn't my band, but I also tried to be a really good fit for them. You know, I wasn't even sure that it was right for me when I was there, but I thought they were really good and they had good gear and they seemed real serious. I just took a shot, you know. Yeah, in fact, let me talk about that because you – in the 90s, like you said, for some reason, all of a sudden you weren't right, but Persistence was a major hit. I mean, it was one of the biggest albums. People always go back and say, oh, the Persistence lineup, oh, the Persistent Days, oh, that air. How do you go from having such a great, successful album to showing the vocalist out the door? Because, you know, you, you think of Aerosmith, you think of Steven Tyler, you think of, you know, like you said, Whitesnake, you think of David Cover. When you think of a band... The vocalist is usually the first person you think of, and you you were the first person they got rid of. <laughs> yeah, and I and and look at <laughs> like, it was a quick switch and bait, man. I'll tell you, I mean that's a whole other story in itself, which I I wouldn't even begin to explain or even go into it. But it was definitely I was caught off guard. I was definitely like you know with one phone call from the management, just like they want to part ways. Like wow, you know, it was as if you know. You were just let off the side of the road before you even got to your next destination, you know, and and actually been the one that helped change the tires to get to that destination, if I may. You know, I was kind of stuck in, in a mode where, like, I wasn't going to beg anybody. You know, you wanted me out, I guess. Uh, I'm not, I mean, if there's got to be something to it, but it seems a little too quick and too fast, too easy for you to do this. Are you sure about that? I didn't even question it, but now, I, I mean, I've always questioned it because, I, as you can see, I, I think, I can't imagine what we could have done. On, I mean, Sound of Night, White Noise, if I sang on that record, forget if you even heard it, it would have been really good. I would have done something really quite good with that record. It wouldn't have, it wouldn't have even have changed any mode that we were in. I just think somehow somebody had a bright idea to get somebody else in there and they got fed up with something. I have no idea. And and they can blame all they want, but I, I was fine. I was doing good with that stuff. I mean, Persistent just happened to be a, a nice uh, thing that we were setting into. Uh, yeah. I, at that point, I have no idea. I mean, maybe that's somewhere down the down the road I'll we'll talk about or right. something. But I, I There'll just, be the uh, Anthrax movie eventually or something, but... Yeah, it's a drag, you know. Really, I mean, for me as a as a musician and that played a a big part in the band, and and to be just told you can't be there anymore is, uh, and and look at, they had someone else even after, as you talked about, real quick after I got in the reunion, boom, I get home and somebody tells me that they just they just hired someone else. I was like, really? Wow. I mean, do they know who they're either hiring? So you think about stuff like that. It's like, what's going on? So, and then to come back, I mean, someone else might have told you, you know where you go, you can go. I'm not coming to forget you guys, but I came back. Uh, you know, that's that's hard to do. Some people wouldn't do that. Yeah, you know? and, and that that's tough. Now, uh, and I'll just ask you sort of a yes or no qu question on that. What, was it just purely financial, where financial considerations as how much to pay each other just interferes, or is it a personality thing where this is like, listen, we we're just not meant to be in the same room together? No, I don't. I know. I mean, personally, to me, I wasn't. I'm not that kind of guy that has controversy. I don't. I don't draw lines with people. I don't push people. I'm a nice person. I'm easy to get along. I'm obviously I'm pretty easy to get along with all the way around because I'm I'm just an easy guy. I mean, I I'm, people tell me that to my face. I'm I'm just that kind of. You know, and I also like to get things done, but I'm not a I'm not a guy that really has a lot of controversy or fights. So I don't think it was that. And I mean, money, yeah, money probably played a role too. Yeah, I'm sure. Why not? I mean, I'm not I'm not saying that for 100, percent but I'll I, you can wave you can wave that flag. That's very possible. You know why not? Now, but uh, what's that mean? I don't know. I don't even know what that means. I mean, now a after you 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 left the band. You went off and you did some solo shows. You put out a few solo albums. Is that, even though you're in the band now, something you would like to get back to and release music that really says, hey, this is Joey Belladonna and not this is Anthrax? Well, I mean, there's always a good time to be able to make some music. I'd love to. I mean, obviously, I haven't had a chance only because, I mean, I have songs. I have, I have ideas and I have uh, people that want to do things that, you know, in all cases, but uh, Anthrax just 
became really rolling so much that I haven't even had a chance to even like finish stuff where I even wanted to put any like hard nosed time into it. I mean, I do my cover thing a lot. I still, I play, I play a lot and I'm I'm, obviously doing just cover music and that's been biding my time pretty good when I'm off because I I never thought of like trying to hit the road with an original band and try to get rehearsals in and all that stuff. I think that that's a harder part when it's local everybody knows the songs we just show up and we play and it's way easier but i'd love to have some music i mean i'm not i'm not one of those guys that get in a band and try to get into something else to do that just so i can show face because some people can't even sit still in one band i didn't do that when i was in anthrax and i didn't do it while i was after it i i I had to do it out of necessity because I, I also wanted to play. So, I mean, I couldn't think of anything else but just being, you know, original. And it was fun. To, it, it was fun. I mean, obviously, while you're out of a band that's big like Anthrax, it's tough to maintain, you know. But I, I didn't have a problem with it because I'm an old schooler and I, and I still drive around my car with my equipment in the back with my drums and my PA and we show up, we set up. So I'm, a, I'm able to do that where some people wouldn't even dare do it after being in this band or whatever band that's in a stage where they don't do that. It's like forget that. I don't. I don't do that shit anymore. Fuck that. I'm not hauling any gear around or showing up and staying out till three in the morning with my. You know what I mean? It's just so I do it. I'd love to. Uh, I just. It's a it's a hard transition sometimes because most people see you as this this guy in that band and it's supposed to be this and that and I'm not going to do that. I don't. I don't. I don't write. Like Anthrax, I don't have all the the same people around doing that, and I don't intend on doing that. So it's weird when you are writing, you're thinking, "Geez, do I have to? Does it have to be this way, or should it be this kind of style?" So I just do what I do, and whoever I'm around that plays like they play, and we just let it fly, and it's kind of fun that way because you don't know what you're going to get, you know. No, and and in fact, as as a fan. I would love to see you go out and do an album that had sort of a melodic feel to it. I could see you doing sort of a deep purplish, early white snakeish kind of album. I, th- I think that would sound fantastic with your voice. Yeah, that'd be a blast. I mean, I'd love to sink deep into something like that, even whether it's in the vein of what people are hearing these days, or it's in or it's not in. I would do it because I like. I would love to hear the music go down and be like that and be quality enough where like he could, you know, and, and some good production too, you know, with maybe a little bit of money behind it where like I've done stuff. Most things I've done are demos where they're not even records. They're done in 12 days and I don't even know the people sometimes and they shouldn't even have gone out. They should have been just called demos or weren't records. And some of them, I don't even know what the hell we were doing. We were doing it. We were just winging it. So, I mean, I never really did anything proper really, I mean, like demos of me and Paulie Crook we did early in the days. That was probably the only thing we did that was like solid. That and we were doing one song a day with everything done completed. By the end of the night, we were like almost ready to move on to another song, and it would be completely finished. It was amazing what we'd do here during the day, all day. Now I know it was a lot of. Sorry. That's right. I was just gonna say I know that in upstate New York you do the cover the cover band thing, as. You and I, as we both get older, is that something, though, you have to start thinking about in terms of when you're off tour, resting the voice, trying to use no. it? As a, no. No. I, I, in fact, when I, when I do the cover band, we do four hours a night. We're doing, like, you know, multiple nights. I mean, some nights I'll do three, four in a row. Like, I just got back from the main tour, and I literally did three nights in a row when I got back. I mean, like, immediately. And I did four hours in each shoot. So there's 60, 70 songs you're doing anywhere, be anywhere from even 50 to 70 songs, you know, and, where and, normally a band would do like 30 songs, three sets or something like that. I'm I'm doing like more than that. Cause we don't even break. We do straight four hours. There's no set list. It's just whatever we feel like playing, whatever the crowd's dictating or whatever we're feeling. And we just wing it. And I'm playing drums and singing the whole night, so it's it's even more involved than it would be just standing up there. I mean, you know, when I run around, I don't know if it's equivalent to sitting on the drums and playing. I mean, they kind of both have their own 
you know thing vibe but yeah, yeah I, and yeah, i've yeah, seen you do that it's, it's different it's, but it's also a strenuing yeah strenuous, strenuous should i say to to do both of those things and they're different in its own way because i'm doing different styles of music you know you do like a triumph and a and a zeppelin and a rush and then deep purple like you mentioned and all these other bands journey foreigner bad company and they're completely different vocal styles which is to me is it's actually good it's good calisthenics it's a it's a really good tool to i mean i i'm kind of gone the opposite i don't i don't sit around i i like and then i have another thing on my own i have all my own tracks and i sing to all this stuff and i track all day to to covers that I do and I just sing all the time I love I love to to create and 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 work at it you know so so for you there's no vocal nodes there's no hardening there's no you're you're in tip top shape as far, as far as vocal yeah, I I, okay. I push I I I go into more the more as I can the the, the more I do it seems the more fun and the more uh achieving i get to to do it i i mean i don't warm up when i go on tour i don't do any of that stuff i mean i could just i get right out of the car and go and start singing you know i don't even i don't even i actually don't do a damn thing well, you know which which is good now uh we have mentioned journey a couple of times they're back four of the fi- five sort of you know the classic lineup if you want with steve smith coming back uh what does that mean to you, knowing that you're such a huge fan? Is that is that something like that excites you, or is it still we need Steve Perry, or it just doesn't count? You know, I I I, I could be there, and I've been there. I've been there many times with with you know when Dean was still in the band, at least you know with the that with the lineup they have now, and I just you know it doesn't doesn't blow me away. I just a lot of the, a lot of the vocal that goes on. I mean, yeah, he can cover it. But some of it's a lot more like watered down. A little, he's varying it so much where it's and the pronunciation and all these kind of things kind of drive me nuts. You know, I just can't, I can't go, can't go bonkers over it. I mean, yeah, it'll be great with Steve Perry, but you look at like we don't, we can't, we can't dictate any of that stuff. I'll just take a solo album if he can put it out. You know, because I love the solo albums and stuff, but. You know, it's good to see that the band still plays. It's like Foreigner. You know, there's one guy left. You know, Mick Jones, yeah. and that's if he even shows up. And they even do a nice job. It's cool, but you know, I mean, it's it, it's it's either that or you don't hear the band ever again. You know. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but since you're a fan of Foreigner, I spoke to Mick Jones on the phone uh, last week, and I actually put the interview out, and he said that in 2017. They are talking with Lou and all the guys that were on the Head Game album, that that lineup, and they are planning a 40th anniversary tour. So you might get that lineup again next year if all goes well. Yeah, I love Lou, and I mean, I mean, and sadly that he went through some stuff that kind of that hindered him a little bit. And I even have a solo album. The, I think he did a Christian album, and I have a, all the Shadow Kings and and all his solo albums and stuff like that. I'm, I've actually became friends with his son. I've been at a wedding with them and stuff with a friend of mine. I got married, and it was nice to be involved and be near him and be able to talk with him. And I've met him a couple of different times, and I love Lou. I mean, you see, those guys on their own, they, they know how to make a record. They know how to sing these songs. and they I mean, it's just amazing. That's what, like, the, the guys that take these places, they just, they don't, they don't have a lot of that to, to bring, you know? They just, they just cover it, and that's it. You know, when it comes to the solo albums, it's just or, or the uh, the albums that they put out with these other guys, it just just doesn't doesn't have all those elements in there. Yeah, no, I know, you know what you that mean. I wish for. Even like Kansas, I mean, I don't even, I think Steve Walsh is gone. You know, there's certain band. I mean, there's Survivor. They got new singers. They got all these. I don't even know if any of these guys can really do the job. You know, it's just it's strange. Even Bad Company at one time replaced. I mean, I'm not to go on a tangent here, but. It's well, a bad company, yeah. They 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 replaced them for a while, and and of course ACDC now was is pulling that. They're they're going to be replacing Brian Johnson. That's so. a that's a weird one too. I mean, God bless and you know all of those guys, and it's too bad because uh, they almost don't need to take that that one one more step. You know, is it just to fill some more shoes uh, shows and leave it at that? You know, I don't know, but. Yeah, I, I guess they could. They they probably should consider doing it like Queen, where it's Queen with Adam Lambert, Queen with Paul Rogers. It should probably be, you know, ACDC with Joey Belladonna or ACDC with Axl Rose. I think that would be interesting. Um, 
Let me get back to anthrax here before yeah, before, yeah, right? <laughs> before we wrap up because we're 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 going all over the place. Uh, you were just on tour opening up for Iron Maiden in South America, flying around on, of course, Ed Force One. Um, just how was that experience being on basically the biggest private jet a rock star could ever have? Well, you'll never find that because no one's going to ever have you on their plane. They don't need to take you. It's just a great opportunity. We happen to know those guys real well. We've toured with them. And then you get to spend time with them and stay in the hotels with them and just become a little closer if, if possible, you know, without being too abrasive or, uh, you know, intrusive in their own time and private time. Uh, it was just really nice. It would a, would a great opportunity and, and a really, really nice tour to go down to South America with them, you know. And we all did really well. It was quite successful. Obviously, we had a little drawback on the engine, the, the, a couple engines that got damaged, you know, and it was just an accident that happened at the runway without us being there. So other than that, it was spectacular. It was, a, it was something that they all wanted us to continue. They were all like, geez, I wish you guys were on the whole run. I'm like, God, you know, I wish we were too. Well, well okay, it, then why aren't you? Oh, I don't know. You know, I guess the scheduling at one time, I think maybe we we had uh, maybe some one else. I don't even know if if something like that could have been changed or was it after we were on that they would have liked it, you know, and we weren't asked anyhow. I, I don't think they even needed us on the on the American run. I, you know, you can debate all those things. I don't know. It depends on who the management felt about it and do they want it all the way. But I just – just the consensus of everyone. We were saying, geez, man, I wish you guys – I don't want you guys to go, man. I love – you guys would do the rest of the tour, you know, maybe they're just being nice too at the same time, but it was a nice gesture just as well. But the tour was great. Again, we had uh, some great fans, new places. We played a lot of new places and uh, it was quite the experience. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of uh, different culture going on over there and it's a lot, a lot to see and a lot to, to feel emotionally, you know? Yeah. And, and, and since I don't want to keep you here all afternoon because you, you've been generous with your time, let me just ask you about the uh, upcoming Anthrax tour dates because you, you mentioned one-offs and you sort of have a slew of one-offs coming up. You've got the uh, Energy Fort Rock, Rock, you know, Carolina Rebellion, it, it, a lot of festival dates. No, what I would call a sort of proper tour, maybe that's not the right word for it, but, but there's not like an Anthrax headlining tour going on. Is, is that something that will come up? Maybe in July, maybe in August, maybe in the fall, or a pairing with another band where that'll bring you to arenas. Where do we go after all these festival dates? Well, we once, you know, I mean, I don't know if you're considering the European ones, right? In May, June, July, and August, all those are all festivals too. Right, they're all there festivals. will be some headlining in there because we've got to go somewhere in between. So we'll, well, we'll do it. some more headlining, like the end of May, mid June, then back again, July, August, all Europe with festivals and some headlining. And then September, there's a tour going to be announced that we'll, we'll support someone in the States. And then from there, maybe there's going to be another a full headlining type thing, whether it be Europe or even America. But, you know, we're getting closer to even doing more of a, a headlining type of thing. You know, obviously for us, we have we have got to make it right for ourselves. But there's definitely a lot of things coming up. The one-offs are cool because, I mean, look, at we probably wouldn't be on half of those things, you know, when you look at the lineups, God, you know. But I, I'm just, just looking – I'm also thinking of the, the the financial feasibility. Like, like let's say June 3rd, you're rocking Vienna, and then June 10th, the Download Festival in Paris, and that's like – yeah, but that's seven days of downtime in Europe. That's – Yeah, that's, that's what they're that's doing costly. right now. They're filling all that stuff, okay. and that's like ongoing. There's a lot of – you know, you can't help but take those shows because they come in, the offers are there, and you do them, but then they fill them. And those could be all headlines between there. It could be a day off, two shows, one day off, two shows, or whatever, how it, it maps out. Or it could be, you know, who knows. Right, right but that, we've done it before. I think even la a couple of years back we did that, and we filled them in. And, you know, whether with Motorhead or Slayer, they'd only do two shows, one show, and then we would do two you know, we'd end up with five in a row where they did two in a row, and then we'd meet up with them again. So we're just shifting back and forth. And I think it's a lot of a lot of paperwork to figure out, can you get from A to B, and then is it feasible to do this and that? You know, so that's, that's when it becomes tricky, I think. I, as I was talking to people yesterday, they're still working on that right now. 
Well, you know? well let's, ho- let's hope they get them all filled in. And uh, yeah. <laughs> th- this will be absolutely the last question because, I, again, you're, I know your time is uh, precious. So uh, Motorhead with Anthrax, I saw you in September in Montreal. It was very obvious that, that Lemmy was ill and uh, the shows were, you know, it was a great package. Uh, how was that tour for you being around Lemmy, being around Motorhead? Uh, was it an easy tour? Was it was it difficult given the situation? H- how was it? You know, I, I don't I don't think we really felt too much as like there was any like huge problem. It was just one of those things, you know, you're healing, you're whatever kind of situation. I didn't get into it with him and, and diagnose any kind of like feel of where he was at, but he was touring. So, and not that we saw each all, uh, all the time. Cause you know, it was the, the scheduling for where they were, when they came in, when they left, when we left and all that kind of stuff. So then see him, it was a cool tour. It was always a good tour. Every time we've done motorhead that I've been in the band was quite, quite nice. I mean, even the last time we saw him was on the boat, you know, a motorboat. And that was, and then they went to Europe. We went to Europe with Slayer. So we were almost going to run into each other one night because they had a day off. So um, even then, you know, he was still rolling. So it was quite good. I mean, obviously, Motorhead and Anthrax is a, a different tour versus, a, you know, it's like right in the middle there. It's not quite super thrash. You know, it's, it's a different That's a tour. powerhouse tour. I mean, that it, it always is. Rock and roll, hard rock, you know, with a little bit of thrash in there, you know, which is cool. It's nice to be built up with that. Where it isn't like Slayer or Megadeth, you know, type of stuff where that's all like that. Or Lamb of God, where we just finished up. So Motorhead was cool, and, you know, it was nice to be able to to be able to be on the bill with him. We get along so good, the whole crew and everybody, we all became such good friends. Same with Slayer when we go out with them. You know, we're all just really, really good friends, so you don't get any mix of egos or, you know, telling you you can't do this, can't do that. So I thought it was great. I had a good time. I mean, I always was ready to step it up being on a tour like that, you know, and it was nice to be able to be out with Lemmy regardless. I mean, I, I tour with him in 1995 on my own and I was, a, it was a pleasure and, and an honor to be able to get on that by myself, you know, yeah. and, and, and God and bless was, him, man. I thought. It was a great show. I, I saw you at that Olympia in Montreal and it was just three hours of pounding, sweating, Everything it was just, it was it was a glorious evening. So so thank you for that. And uh, hey, th- <laughs> thank you, Joey. Always Welcome. an absolute pleasure uh, to talk to you. Yeah, you too, man. I'm, I'm glad you reached out. That's cool. Yeah. And there you have it, folks. My interview with lead singer Joey Belladonna of Anthrax. For All Kings is the new album. Let's get right over to Hardline and their singer Johnny Gioli. He's got a debut solo album coming up. You can find that on Pledge Music, and of course, just Google it if you want. Uh, so without further ado, here is the one, the only, Johnny Gioli. We are speaking with Johnny Gioli. Did I say that right? You said it pretty darn close, man, like a pasta dish. Gioli. I know. Giovanni I see. Giovanni Baptista Badalino Pericone Gioli. No, you just call me Johnny, Mitch. Johnny, What's going on? No, not much. We're, we're, we're here to talk about you, actually. Talk about your album. Talk about Hardline. Talk about uh, Axel. Oh, see, now I'm going to get hung up on that name. Rudy Pell, right? Axel yeah, Rudy man. Pell. Uh, we can talk about Axel Rose, too, if we want. Uh, why not? We can't <laughs> talk, about, we can talk about your rainstorm you're having, whatever. Oh, we're having freezing rain today. But all right, let's, t- let's talk about this debut album. You chose to go the route of Pledge Music. Yes. Uh, talk to me about that experience. And, you know, I... I put a kiss tribute together through pledge music in 2013 raise money for a palliative care home where my wife's father passed away and um mm-hmm. you know through pledge music we raised over thirty five thousand dollars for the home so i've had um that's cool man right i had a bad experience turn into a very great experience so how has it been for you and now that yours is all going to a children's charity right yeah so um yeah and for the same exact reason uh, I decided to, you know, create a solo CD, solo record for giving away my age when I say record, right? So a solo uh, CD, solo effort to, you know, to, to, to express my, you know, creative juices, get everything, uh, you know, in order. It's been a long time. I've been in the industry for over 30 years. And I said, now, how do I connect with people 
who put me in this position. I'm grateful, man. I mean, this is like hitting the lottery. To be able to get a record deal, to be able to have – I have over – with Axel and Crush, I have maybe four or five hundred songs out there. I have 30-plus albums. And these – you know, this music that I create would be just that. It would be just music unless the fans supported it and, um, you know, and, and appreciated it, loved it, et cetera. So I said, how do I do this? How do I make them part of it? And then I discovered Pledge Music. I did research. I'm a, you know, I, I'm technical, but I'm not that technical. I just started poking around. I said, wait a minute, this is awesome. This is a forum where all the people that have been so great to me can participate in the making of. Because man, back in the day, as, as, as you may very well remember, everything was so top secret. You didn't know where Van Halen was recording. You didn't know where Scorpions, where Kiss was recording. You you tried to wait outside, of, you know, in Manhattan. You try to wait for Paul Stanley to run out, uh, you know, and to go to Sam Ash to grab a new guitar, yeah. you know. And you just didn't know it was top secret. And I didn't want any secrets. I wanted to uncover, you know, this is the way uh, we make music and and have the people who put me in this great position be part of it. And so it's my way of giving back you know, to the, to the fans in, in my deep appreciation and also to be charitable and give, give back. And we have a family here in, in my hometown in Connecticut here, um, that, uh, young boy, uh, 17 years old, dove into the Long Island Sound, hit a rock. His name is Joe Barber and he is paralyzed. Uh, we hope temporarily, um, you know, from the chest down and there's a million charities as we know, man. Uh, but this one is in my backyard, and I had to do something. The family needs money, rehabilitation for a for a you know paralysis like this. In his lifetime, will be about eight million dollars. People don't realize how expensive this is just wow. to equip the house to accommodate. He can't move, man. Every day it's just you know he hopes to get some movement out of a finger. So I said, you know what? I've been so blessed. My career, my life. I've got to do something. So Pledge Music, that, that forum just allowed me to do everything in one shot. And I love the social activity with the fans. I didn't do that before, man. I was, I was never a Facebook guy and this and that and the other. It's all you know, new to me. And uh, now it's just been, man, it's like, a, it's like a resurrection, man. We got Easter coming up. It's like a resurrection here for me to be able to talk to the fans and get their feedback and have them – you know, see these updates and uh, it's just, man, really, it's, it's the most exciting thing um, that I've encountered since getting my first record deal, man. Yeah, really a special and that, that connection with the fans and, and you're right about the, the secrecy. I remember very specifically uh, years ago, 1983, walking past a record store and I saw the new Kiss album in the window and I was like, huh? They have a new album, like <laughs> right, you know? right, and, yeah. and and it was just like, oh, and I was a Kiss fan, and I I was part of the you know the news groups and whatever the um, fan mailing things, and I hadn't heard of it until I accidentally walked by, and it was like, huh. So no, it, this really is something different and exciting, and it and it gives you it makes you feel part of the process uh, as a yes. fan, and that's great. That's true. Yep, and I look. So I have one quick Kiss story for you. There's no never proof. enough. Qu- Kiss Let me tell you, this is funnier than hell. So my parents, so I started performing professionally and touring at 11 years old. I don't remember many days in school. I had tutors, the whole thing. I was laser focused on music. I, when my friends were playing with Tonka toys, I was writing songs. One day, um, well, two, two Kiss stories, quick, sorry. So Paul Stanley actually called my house because he heard some music that I created and he was starting to get involved in producing and he asked me to write some more songs. So I told my mom, I said, I'm not going to school. I'm going to stay in the studio. We had a little studio in the basement. I'm going to work. She said, okay. So uh, I'll never forget this because, you know, I was kind of like a, you know, a, a little hometown star in Pennsylvania and so the principal at the high school at the time, I was very, I was probably my freshman year, said, look, we know you, you do music and we know you're right and we know you're touring. And, but, but 
how many stomach aches can you have on your excuse when you go back to school? Just tell us the truth. So after I did the recording, I sent everything off to Paul Stanley. My mom said, what do you want me to write on the excuse? I said, Ma, the principal said, don't make an excuse. Just tell them the truth. So my mom wrote, Paul Stanley from KISS called the house and wanted Johnny to write funnier than hell. Well, let me tell you, the school went ballistic on me, screaming, yelling at me like, you need an education. And you do. Don't get me wrong. But flipping out on me. So I, I left school and pursued my music career. That was my kiss first kiss story. That's a great one, by the way. Second kiss story is we waited for Paul Stanley to come out of that recording studio with my mother. And my mother chased him down with one of my demo tapes. This is when I was a little kid. I had to be 14, 15 years old. And he almost broke his ass. She made him trip and he almost killed himself. He she was she ran after him like a mad stalker to get that demo tape to Paul Stanley. And you know what? He took it. And this was this was prior to him calling me, of course. But I said, my, you almost killed Paul Stanley. That's Paul Stanley from Kiss. You can't kill Paul Stanley. So anyway, that's my Kiss stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, you, you didn't want to do that. Um, well, you know, you, there is the one more since we're on the whole Kiss thing. Diamonds Unlocked by uh, Axel Rudy Pell. You did Love Gun on yes. that album. Uh, yeah. I, I, I must say that is where things really changed for me. You know, when I listened to Double Eclipse with Hardline, it was really about Neil Sean and, and no offense, but that's what it was back then. Oh, sure, sure. But when I heard the Love Gun version that you did, it is just absolutely brilliant. It is it is a great interpretation. Um, so th- I just wanted to mention that and 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 a great oh, covers sure. album altogether. Thank you, bro. Thank you very much. They actually loved it too. Uh, they had to approve everything, so uh, that was really that was pure happiness, man. When when you know, Kiss said that they loved that version. So I was pretty excited about it. So thank you for those kind words, man. Yeah. So, so if, in fact, in fact, if folks haven't picked that up, go get Diamonds Unlocked. It came out uh, 2007, I guess. So something like that. Something yep. like that. Now, the, the debut album, you've done Hardline. You've done Axel. You've done, um, uh, what's the other one? Crush 40. Crush 40, yep. Why so long to be... Johnny, why why did you not do it sooner? Good question, Mitch. I you know, I'm what you call an oxymoron singer. I'm I don't think I don't consider myself a normal singer. And and this is this is I'm not being disrespectful to any other singers out there, but I, I have the ego of a peanut shell. And I just never found it appropriate to I always love band environments. And I just thought it was a little, you know, a little egotistical to do a solo album. You know what I mean? I don't know. And but this is obviously not about ego at all. This is about creativity. And yeah, man, it took over 30 years. And one day I woke up and I said, I want to do something for myself that I can involve fans. That's it. It's, It's all it was. I didn't put a lot of thought into it. I just woke up one day and said, I I need to do this. I need to be creative, um, you know, by myself. So that's how it happened, man. Honest to God. That simple. Musically though, does it, does it differ because you know, you've done or you're known, I guess, for the melodic hard rock stuff. Does this become something totally different where you're doing country music or, or jazz (laughs) or, or what are we getting? Well, Look, you know, I wrote 98% of the hardline music and uh, the, you know, melodies in me. So you're going to get something different? No, I'm not going to experiment. I'm not going to give you a country record, reggae, pop, rap record. I am who I am. And but lyrically, musically, it's going to be me. So um, I love a great ballad. I love great positive vibe. I love something where you just want to, you know, music where you want to roll the windows down and crank it up. And so the short answer is uh, you're just going to get me. No experimentation at all. That sounds, that sounds good. Now, uh, let me talk about Hardline. Here's this band that started off in 91, 92, Neil Sean is there, Dean Castronovo, who eventually joined Journey as well. Uh, Double Eclipse was a brilliant 
brilliant album, um, Hot Cherry. Yep. One of the most memorable songs to come out of that period. What happened with the band that it took so long for the second album to come out? Because it came out 10 years later. Why did you hit the ground running and then just go, whoop, well, we're gone? You know, man, uh, that's a, such a great question. I wish I had a great answer. But, you know, when the whole – I'll never forget, Mitch. We were in the recording studio. We were actually finishing up some vocals for Double Eclipse. And one of the record company executives came in and said, hey, listen to this thing. It's a new band called Pearl Jam. And we turned it on. I was like, I'm like, what the hell is this? I said, this isn't going to do anything. And the record company executive laughed. He goes, you watch, man. This is going to be like the new sound. So we were sort of doomed uh, with our timing. And the whole grunge thing happened. And we had a good run, man. We sold a lot of records. I think we put out a very, very good record. Some people classify that Double Eclipse record as like a classic, you know, I agree. record. And we did a good job. Our timing was wrong. Timing was off. And then the, the industry and radio lost faith in that kind of sound. And... We took, yeah, um, Dean, Todd, and Neil went out on the road with Paul Rogers to help him musically. They stayed out way too long. The record company got antsy. I, I, I wrote every single day while they were gone. I started to conform, or at least tried to conform to that sound. And that wasn't me. And um, just a lot of stuff happened, man. And then... The record company decided, uh, okay, we don't know how to um, how to fit you into the industry right now, into that sound. But you guys have the talent, they would tell us. You guys have the talent to sound like a Pearl Jam. Just give me stuff like that. And I said, no, I, 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 it's not me. I can't do that. So the record deal ended. And then look, you know, Neil's high-profile musician uh, – you know, big bills, fast cars, you know, he's got to keep that money flowing. And I understand that. And everyone just kind of scattered like roaches when you turn the lights on. So that's really what happened. And then I went through a pretty severe depression period where I needed to kind of regain my creativity, regain my strength after going through that. I mean, think about it. So as I said earlier, I was 11 years old playing, playing professionally. I got this record deal. It was like $8, 9000000 million when I was in my young 20s, 21, 22. Actually, it all started to happen around 89, and uh, but the record came out in 92. But all my life working towards that and then like in a flash, it's gone. That has some pretty serious effect on you. So that's why all that time, Mitch. That's why I needed to regain my strength and my creativity and everything and figure out where I needed to be. And I disappeared for a while. And then I said, you know what the heck with it? I don't care if I sell 10 records. I want to make the music I want to make. And that's when the rest of the Hardline records came out. Right. And so the last one came out in 2012. We're now 2016. Is the band going to be putting out more with you singing or you sort of moved on and we're just going to do the solo thing from now on? No, I obligated to, uh, to one more, Mitch, and we're finishing that record up now, as a matter of fact, and that'll be done this summer um, with uh, Alessandro De Vecchio, you know, on keys and he's producing and um, playing keys and background vocals with me. And uh, so we're going to do another hardline record and just kind of see how it goes. I mean, I, you know, that's what I'm known for. I love it. Um, you know, and that was my hardline was my baby. So it's pretty much, it's, it's pretty hard to, uh, to, you know, to get rid of your baby. Um, the solo project, you know, will I continue as just Johnny? I, I, I don't know, man. I, I really don't know. All I can tell you is um, another hardline record is, uh, in the works. It's all written. And I'm going to do a solo CD, which everyone can pledge for at pledgemusic.com forward slash Johnny Gioelli. And I'm just going to leave it at that, man. Just kind of, you know, music for me now is is all about um, the freedom, the freedom to make it. 
Uh, I'm not shackled by a by a record company, and you have to do this and you have to do that. It's it's pure freedom, like it was when I was 11 years old. It's 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 wild, man. How things come full circle. You kind of you know, you know, you, you evolve, and then you just go back to being like the uh, you know a baby again. And right now, my music, I don't I don't make the music for money. I don't I make it for making music. So and that's the way I started. So it's it's kind of cool to uh, sort of be in you know to be in this position right now. Yeah, it really is. Uh, the second album had Bobby Rock on it, drummer Bobby Rock, who's playing with Lita Ford these days, I believe. Yes, he is. Yep. Um, he was in, of course, the Vinnie Vincent Invasion. You were introduced via Dana Strum, yep. uh, who's a good guy. I love Dana. He's a great guy. Yeah, email him all the time. Great, great guy. Did he tell you any Vinnie Vincent stories? Well, you know, back in those days, um, we the Hot Cherie song came by uh, way of Dana Strum. It was Dana Strum who said, here's a song that should have been a ma- massive hit song, um, and it should be remade, and here's how I would do it. I thank Dana Strum for that. He gave us that song and that idea uh, to do. And that was right before – wait, was that before or was that after – Vinnie Vincent. I think that was after Vinnie Vincent. But anyway, I've known Dana for a long time. I haven't spoken to him in years and years and years, and I hope he's well. But uh, yeah, it was Dana who did that. But Vinnie Vincent, yes. There was um, – I can't uh, recall any one specific, specific story, but I know that they, they Vinnie drove those guys nuts. Mark uh, Slaughter and, and Dana, they, they drove those guys insane. Bobby too. Bobby's just like, oh, my God. Just yeah, drove yeah. them nuts. They yeah. never knew, you know, from one day to the other, you know, what was going to happen with with Vinny on stage. You just never knew. So, uh, but yeah, Dana Strum was the one who recommended that we remake uh, Hot Cherie. That's how that happened. Wow. That's a, that, hey, Dana's got a great, you know, ear for talent. He's oh yeah, uh, you know, he was work. You know, he was he helped Kiss get Vinny. He helped uh, Randy Rhodes find his way to Ozzy. He's he's got an eye and an ear for talent. Um. Your brother Joey, yeah, uh, stayed with you in Hardline for a while, and eventually walked away. Um, sad moment, good moment, in the sense that hey, you needed to be free from him, or was it like, come on, why didn't you stay with us and let's just keep this team together? No, it was never like that at all. What what happened was in 1995, we were on a tour bus. And my brother said there's this thing called the information superhighway, and they're going to call it the internet. And there's these things called websites. And we were on the road, and we were credit card guys. We used our credit cards, you know, credit card, credit card, credit card, cash advance from the record company. That's how we live, credit card, credit card, credit card. We're traveling. So um, he said there's these things called websites, but they don't take credit cards. So I said, wow, that's pretty cool. Uh, what, you know, what do you want to do? And he said, well – um, we should figure out how we can use one of these credit cards on these websites for these companies that want to sell products. So Mitch, my brother, a very, very brilliant guy, he actually invented the internet commerce gateway. So when you use your credit card, the system that he developed um, – made sure that you had the funds available from your issuing bank. So if you bank with like, a, you know, Bank of Ontario, uh, we, the, the, he created the code to verify your funds. And I, it, it's, wow. it's brilliant. And we built a very large company in California. At one time we had uh, 300 employees and Joe just kind of shifted into business. And we were so busy. We grew from an eight by eight office to a million square feet um, in in the matter of two years. And uh, and Joe Joey still runs that company today. Um, but I departed from that company. I was I was done. I just was burnt out. Um, so it was never really a bad you know departing. And, gotcha. and he still loves music. And it's just you know life took over and business took over and. Uh, that was it, man. You know, he just, he still plays, you know, he still has a bunch of guitars and stuff like that. And you never know. We may, we may do something together. You never know. But he's West Coast now. I'm East Coast now. So, you know, I don't get to see him that much anymore. That's great. So when people head over to pledgemusic.com to buy your debut solo album, 
uh, your brother gets kickback. So it's perfect. <laughs> yeah, he does. I mean, he does, I'm sure. Yeah, and um, let me let me just wrap up with this. Neil, Sean, how, how did you get into a band with Neil in the first place? I mean, you know, he was with Santana and Journey, and he had the, the major success. How does he hook up with you? Like, where? How does Hardline start? Good question. It's funny. My my twelve year old son just asked me that question in the car. Just you know, thirty five minutes ago, Neil uh, met my sister. Uh, they were together for about eight years, and we would do the ritual holiday family gathering. Well, we never asked Joey and I. Never asked anything of Neil. Never. We never used his his success, his his you know his power in the industry, his knowledge in the industry for our personal gain. We never did. One year at Christmas time, my brother and I were in the kitchen and we were playing "Face the Night." I won't let you face the night alone. And we're playing this song acoustically, and he comes running into the kitchen. He goes, "Give me the guitar, man!" And he picks it up, and he says, "Try this." Try that and these, this amazing chord knowledge that he has. He's brilliant. He can't name the damn chord, I'll remind you. He cannot name the chord. He can kind of figure it out. But it's all, for Neil, it's all feel. He just knows where to go. He knows what he hears. And so I said to him, Neil, oh, my God, that just took that song to a whole different dimension. Are you interested in producing a record that Joey and I were going to do a hard rock version of like a Nelson group, you know, just but heavy, hard, you know, long haired rock thing. He goes, well, I'm, I'm recording the next bad English record, but and my schedule is going to be pretty tight. But after my studio time with bad English, I'll listen to what you're writing and I'll help you with it. And let's see what happens. Well, Neil. And I did just that, Mitch. I worked every day at Neil's house in California all day, writing, writing, writing. He would come home from the studio and he'd go, OK, Johnny, let me listen to what you wrote. And I wrote Can't Find My Way and Change a Heart and Rhythm from a Red Car and all this stuff that you hear on um, Double Eclipse. And he fell in love with the music and he literally asked to join the band. And I said, no. I had a completely different vision. And I'll never forget that because my sister called me because Neil is so upset that you don't want him in the band. I said, Dina, it's not that he's not awesome. I just have a different vision. Joey and I were going to do a like a solo brothers thing. It was called Brothers. And we just have a different vision for what we want. And so he goes, but he, my sister said, he's really upset about it. So I talked to my brother. I said, Joe, what, you know, what do we have to lose? It's Neil Sean. He's brilliant. We'll learn so much about the industry. Musically, he's a, you know, he's a genius and we'll learn. I, I think it's just a win-win. Let's do it. And that's, that's what happened, Mitch. And we said, okay, Neil, you can, you can join the band. Never, <laughs> that's funny. I, I don't think I've ever told anyone that story, man. You're the first. And that's, that's really what happened. It's a great, great story. And, and listen, it worked out. Like you said, Double Eclipse is one of those classic albums that you can't not love and, 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 you know, and that other car, uh, the, the, um, the song you just mentioned, uh, rhythm from a red car is fucking brilliant. It's, it's just, oh, brilliant. Thank you, bro. just absolutely brilliant. Uh, Dean Castronovo, of course, uh, yeah. recently left journey. And, uh, I, I just want to say that I wish him all the best, uh, out loud, uh, hope, him. Hope, you know, in case he's listening to this, I just want to say, Hey, you know, stay strong, be well. And, yeah, uh, I love him. I love him to pieces. He's a great human. We shared a lot of – look, we all go through stuff in our life, man. Stuff happens. But the core of Dean Castronovo is a core of goodness and a beautiful person. Um, we all have our struggles. Uh, Dean I, – I miss Dean so much. He is so talented. He is brilliant. That guy can play piano, bass, guitar, drums – the freaking flutophone. He's an amazing talent, and I don't want you know his personal life and to people to view him, uh, you know, as a bad guy. He's a great human. I love him. Yeah, and uh, he sings like a son of a gun. Oh. And and his last album, Revolution Saints, that included Doug Aldridge, somebody that you've worked with also. Yep, yep. Uh, it is just fantastic. And and we need to have a Revolution Saints too. And quite frankly. 
uh, you should be on that project and just you know get you guys back together and make something wonderful. Yeah, I'm straight. I'm you know? with that, brother. I'm with you. I'll do it. Yeah, Johnny, a great, great pleasure to speak with you today, and uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, to the new solo album. Thank you, bro. Yeah, Pledge Music. I want to thank everyone. Thank you, Mitch, for taking the time. Thanks, uh, everyone out there, for your support. For 30 plus years, I feel like an old man, and I am an old man. But uh, thank you, everyone. I, I hope I hope the creativity uh, keeps happening for me, and uh, and that you enjoy it, and uh, that it does uh, something positive for 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 everyone in their lives. Great, thank you, thank you, sir. You got it, man. Take care, Mitch. Be well, bro. Yeah, thank you. And there you have it, folks. My interview with Johnny Joelli. Uh, like a pasta dish, I guess is how you say that. From Hardline, his new debut solo album is currently up at Pledge Music. You can go and pledge for that. Uh, Joey Belladonna from Anthrax, thank you. Johnny, thank you. Uh, for me, head over to at Mitch Lafon on Twitter and one-on-one Mitch Lafon on Facebook. Bye for now. <laughs>